All right, so let's continue with our Molt uh, presentation. I'll go back to screen sharing so we can pick up where we left off. So now we're thinking about the uh, various strategies that birds use to replace those feathers. And you might think, well, uh, you could just do them all at once. Uh, and so in fact, that's a pattern that we see if we're just thinking about the flight feathers. That is a pattern we see in loons. Here's a loon, common loon. And you can see the feathers we see, they're not actually the, the wing feathers. These are the covering feathers. The flight feathers are so small that they're tucked in underneath these coverts. So you're not even seeing the full uh, size of the wing of an adult bird. That part is missing. They've all, they've lost all of those feathers. Here on this grebe, you can see that a little better. Every one of the feathers is coming in at once. Just a few of these inner mm, tertials um, seem to be retained, but basically it's losing uh, most of the wing, it almost looks like a baby wing again. And then alcids like puffins and murrelets, they do the same thing. Here we've got the same situation where we've only, we're only seeing a few of the flight feathers just emerging here. They're very short as well. You're not seeing the base of them encased in the sheath as you do on this grebe, that sheath is what protects the follicle as it's pushing out that length of feather um, in, during growth. That sheath eventually falls off as once the feather is grown and has matured. Um, and ducks and geese, they also replace all their feathers at once. Sometimes you can see them flapping their wings and there just isn't, aren't any longer feathers there. And uh, what's the other group that replaces all their feathers at once? Well, whoops, for some reason, oh, there it goes. Most juvenile birds, that's the barns fall we saw at the beginning. You can see the bird band. We were doing some banding at the uh, zoo in Seattle. <clears throat> um, and so we're banding the birds in nest, the nestlings, uh, before they were ready to fledge. So we put them back in the nest, then they were, would be, would complete their growth process and then fledge from the nest. If you do it early enough, um, then they won't fly away from the nest, but you have to do it late enough so that the legs are kind of adult sized. So they're molting all at once as well. Well, oh, there's a couple things that um, connect all these birds into a strategy. Turns out all these, these birds that do it, they're all water birds. They're swimming on the surface of the water. They've got a medium water that protects them in that they can f swim on, on the surface and perhaps avoid predators from below or dive and escape predators from above. So the ability of, of escaping is a feature that these birds share and allows them to replace all their feathers at once. Ducks and geese, some of the ducks and the geese, they don't really dive. So what they do is they find places that are safe from predation. A lot of the geese nest up in, uh, other than our domesticated Canada geese that are safe on our little ponds and stuff, our city ponds. But most geese um, breed up in the Arctic where the number of predators just can't manage um, the, uh, to depredate enough geese to make an impact on their uh, population when they're doing their molt at the end of the summer. And ducks retreat into the reeds and bushes if they are not diving ducks. And the others, they are in the open ocean or in big lakes and can dive and escape the risk of predation by going under the water or scattering <coughs> if, uh, if some if large predator comes from below. And juvenile birds, well, they are stuck in a nest and they've got to grow their feathers some, somewhere. They can hardly really do it in the, in the egg. We'll see some, at the end, we'll see a little variation on that theme. Um, and so they grow them in the nest. Turns out that that is an extremely vulnerable 
spot for them to be in. So they don't spend, they spend as little time as they can in the nest before they fledge. Um, vulnerable, I mean, because if a predator finds a nest, that's a nice set of morsels for a, for a meal um, to uh, take advantage of. And so they grow feathers as fast as they possibly can. That's all they're doing in the nest. The adults are feeding them. They don't have to fly. They don't have to waste energy. All they're doing is growing those, growing those feathers to get out of the nest and be able to fly and, uh, and feed themselves like swallows. They need the feathers just to learn to feed. They can't feed without the ability to be airborne and collect aerial um, insects. So you can do it all at once, kind of makes things faster, but it's kind of risky. You have to have, you know, only survive if you've got other strategies to tide you over those four to six, six weeks, those four weeks, I guess, shorter, right? To grow them all at once, um, if, you're, if that's your strategy. Song, uh, hardly any songbirds, adults, uh, molt their feathers um, that way, molting them all at once. Instead, they have a uh, sequential molt. They, uh, sequ by sequential molt, we mean a molt where they replace feathers in a certain pattern. And again, we're focusing on, on the flight feathers because those are such an important component of the whole plumage. And the way they do, to, do that is they simply break up their flight feathers into particular series that allows for um, orderly uh, sequential feather loss and growth and for some amount of overlap between um, feathers. If you think about it, if you do it slow enough and replace one feather after another, you can uh, maintain the ability to fly. You don't even have to lose your flight capacity. And um, furthermore, by varying the number of feathers um, that you grow at the same time, uh, you can retain more flight capacity or speed up the process. And so there's some flexibility in, dis, in, quote, designing, in other words, evolving a strategy that suits your ecology. On this image of a, I think this is another um, chat uh, wing, I just want to point out the, um, the sets of feathers we're seeing because we'll be referring to them. So wing feathers consist of a set of Pr uh, primary feathers, whoops. Primary feathers are the outer ones and they're the main drivers of powered flight. So when a bird flaps its wings, these outermost tips of the outermost feathers are traveling the furthest, furthest through the air column and pushing the bird um, forward to gain enough um, speed so that the airfoil that then forms just by the stretched out wing can provide the lift necessary to stay aloft. So those primaries are these feathers. They're connected to the fingers of the, um, of the wing below the wrist. And then uh, the inner part of the wing is made up of these feathers here. In, in, what, oh, in songbirds, it's nine to 10 primaries. These are the, the secondaries, one, two, three, four, five, six. There they are. You can see that the shape is slightly different. They're a little bit broader. The asymmetry of the primaries is a little bit stronger. That means the outer web is narrower and the inner web is wider. In the secondaries, the outer web starts getting a little bit broader um, and they help. Um, that's because they're serving a slightly different purpose. They're mostly um, maintaining that airfoil. So you can see how they overlap to create, here's that overlap to create that smooth foil that provides the lift. So one, two, three, four, five, six, that's the second berries. And then these innermost um, flight feathers, they're called the tertials. There's just three of them and they connect uh, to the upper arm. And you can see that here, the width of the two sides of the vein become much more similar. And in fact, these feathers are less involved with providing power or lift, but basically they serve to cover these feathers all up when they're folded against the body. So this 
set of feathers. The three of them, you can only see one of them here, of these tertials. They sit above these feathers in the folded wing and protect it from insulation, insulation I mean the sun exposure um, that makes the feathers brittle and helps to wear them out. And so that's protection, lift, and power. So the sequence that I'm uh, addressing for the song for the songbirds is um, fairly standard. You'll see this repeated in one way or another um, with all across the songbird um, family, songbird order. Uh, and that is they start in the middle with a patch of feathers right in the middle. Those are the central most um, uh, feathers on the wing, the innermost primaries of the ten, nine to 10 primaries. So here's primary one, two, and three. And up here, what you're seeing is the primary coverts that are very close to the primaries in their attachment point. They're molting at the same time along with the primaries themselves. These feathers right here are the greater coverts. These are the feathers that cover the secondary bases um, and make up, for example, a wing bar. In this case, they're just being replaced now. And you can see they don't re uh, replace with the um, secondaries. They replace as a tract uh, distinctly on their own. So we're already seeing some variation of these specific patterns that I was talking about. Primary coverts molt with the primaries. Secondary coverts, the greater secondary coverts, they molt as a tract on their own. Um, and so we're already seeing this differentiation into the different tracts. And uh, here you can already see this uh, sequencing where central feathers molt first. And now the bird is waiting. It's not dropping these other feathers until these grow back a little bit more on a Swainson's thrush. So this is how it proceeds from there. Um, uh, let's see, let's uh, do uh, this one first. This is a three-toed woodpecker up in the, in the uh, mountains, the Cascade Mountains, and it's in the middle of the molt. Uh, here's primary one, two, three, and four. They're all fresh and now full grown. And see now it's moved on to primary five, six, seven, eight, nine primaries have 10 primary, primary uh, woodpeckers have 10 primaries. So the 10th is a little one that's hidden under, underneath here. Um, and so it's about halfway through the primaries and it's in the middle of growing. That's active growth at the base in that follicle that we can imagine now that we saw one um, that's actively growing a couple of millimeters a day. Um, what happens next is uh, what you see over here on a Nashville warbler. Look, it's only got two feathers left out here. Uh, one, two, three, four. Here's primary five, but it's already dropped six and seven. So there's a big gap in there. Uh, you can imagine that flight isn't that great at this point. So maybe it's doing more gleaning um, than it would uh, at other times when it might do a little more fly catching or a mix of things. In any case, uh, you can see the cost of replacing feathers here. There's a big gap in that powering of the wing. Look, this one isn't full grown yet either. And if you look at the secondaries, actually, um, you can only see four of the secondaries. One, two, three, four. Turns out it looks like there's a gap here. Yeah, it's probably dropped um, secondary one and two as well. So the process is you start from the middle of the wing um, and kind of create a sequence going out among the primaries. And when you get halfway out, you start in the secondaries and move inward so that the older feathers are these inner secondaries as you go through, uh, as you go through this set. Um, so that creates, I actually did a little uh, uh, analysis of this and this is um, remarkable in that if you had asymmetry in where this break was in the wing, this gap, um, it would create a weakness for the bones of the wing. And so this is one way to maintain um, as much symmetry in the arrangement of the gap um, as possible. So you start with a gap in the middle, it starts propagating out, it becomes asymmetrical here kind of leaning toward the outer part, that risks breakage in the, in the structure of the wing, the bones of the wing. Um, and so at that point, by starting here, just off center of the middle of the wing and going this way, you're creating a second wave 
um, that creates a second gap that um, minimizes the asymmetry of that gap, the gap, gappiness of the wing. Um, and then finally, um, you can see that the secondaries start to fill in this gap. And so this gap is propagating this way. And this gap is going to finish up with those outer primaries. Notice that on this woodpecker, these, these brown feathers, these sun bleached feathers are the old feathers. And these uh, inner, innermost secondaries, um, maybe four tertials on a woodpecker, remember it's not a passerine, but a clo close to a passerine, um, that they have their own schedule. So they're not uh, falling out, they're not being replaced in the same pattern um, as the bulk of the secondaries. The same thing happens to, to uh, songbirds. This, these, um, that's the leg you see there shining through a um, tertial. They're falling out in the middle of the replacement of the secondaries as well. So primaries first, um, joined by the secondaries going inwards, and then the tertials, the three of them, just kind of drop in the middle of the of the full of the maximum replacement level of all those flight feathers. So here's another um, a long bird in two, three, four feathers completely, and growing a fifth one here, and this one isn't even. This one isn't even full grown. Uh, yeah, so you, uh, my internet connection is unstable, so I don't know if you heard that. This Nashville warbler is missing two feathers here and two feathers here. So it's missing four of about, uh, well, 10, 16, 19 feathers. So that's a 20% of the feathers of the wing are gone at the same time. And that probably impedes its flight a bit. On this flat bill, the flat bills belong to the family of flycatchers. And so they're, they rely on their wings to be faster than the insects that they're trying to catch for food. They're obligate aerial insectivores. And so to avoid the impact on flight, we can examine um, this pattern in a flat bill. And look, uh, flat bills, flat catchers have 10 primaries. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, four, three, two, one. And then here's the first secondary, the second secondary, three, four, five, six, and a tertials. So look, what you see is what you get. He's only growing two feathers at the same time, even though he's in a pattern that's similar to the Nashville warbler. Um, in other words, a sequence that's similar, but he's just overlapping fewer feathers at once. So he's just molting primary seven, and secondary two, whereas the Nashville warbler is, is lost seven and eight, uh, six and seven, and primaries and secondaries one and two, while growing this one feather and this one, and those feathers are all starting to grow as well. The feathers drop when they're pushed out by the follicle stimulated to grow another feather. So you can see that the flat bill, this is part of the ecology I'm talking about, the flat bill is avoiding um, uh, losing a lot of feathers at once um, to presumably to maintain effective flight for catching its food. And then once you're close to done, you can see that the primaries have filled in here and it's just the outermost feathers, nine and 10, uh, eight and nine sparrows have nine primaries, eight and nine that are still completing growth. On the secondary, you can see it's a little different. That um, gap is moving close to the to the base of the wing, and we've got secondary four, five, and six left. One and two, one is almost full grown. Two is mostly grown. Three it must be hiding under the greater coverts there, which are all fresh, and so these will be still go ahead and be replaced. Looks like the tertials are very fresh. You don't see any wear like you do on these secondaries. Um, so they must have already been replaced. And in fact, I can see that this outermost tertial, tertial one um, will end up being as long as the secondary 
quite a bit longer than Churchill too, so it's probably still sheathed at, sheathed at the base and growing out to its full length. So the last feather to be replaced on a wing is likely to be S6. As you can see, it hasn't even started growing. P9 is, uh, is already halfway grown, and so uh, the last feather to be replaced on this wing is going to be that S6. So if we're looking for the for traces of molt on a bird in the hand, I'll check the innermost secondary to see if that's still got a little sheathing at the base of it. And that whole process of replacing all those feathers for a songbird that's doing the sequential molt is about four to six weeks. Uh, we figure um, you can actually count bars on these wings. Let's see if I've got one that shows that. Uh, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna take you off here. Stop share and see if you can see it on this, if I hold the feather just right with the lighting kind of at an angle. If I can get you to see that. Yeah, right there. If I hold it right there, I think you can see right on this area right here. I've got some bars, a dark bar and a pale bar and dark bar. Those are day and night patterns of, of deposition. Like right there, the lighting shows it. So each day and night, the me metabolic follicle activity is registered in these slight differences in deposition of material on the feather. So you can calculate how many t days it takes. So this is actually one of the coolest feathers. This is a Mot Mot feather um, from cen South Central America. Um, and it looks like, wow, it's got like a little tip. And then uh, it only started here again. Uh, Mot Mots are interesting. They grow these feathers as, uh, as, uh, as uh, mate attraction features. And so um, they want them to look cool. And apparently it's a Mot Mot thing. Um, the adults grow these feathers. They are barbed all the way to the tip. And then the Mot Mots themselves, they rip off the barbs in this area, remove them so that they create this kind of special feature. So when they're fresh, there should be barbs all, the, all along here. And then you can actually see them pulling at the barbs to create uh, kind of a jewelry to uh, let their mates uh, admire. Both males and females do that. And in any case, uh, what we saw is that um, you can figure out how many days it took to grow, grow a feather like this by calculating the number of these par bears, pair, bar pairs, um, the dark and the light together make a night and day um, deposit. So, you know, just in this area right here, we have about five of those. So maybe 10 times. So this, this feather took particularly long to grow 50 days. That's more than the usual time, um, but it's a special decor. So maybe just that length of time is a special, has special meaning for mot mots. Um, so you can use that growth pattern to look at uh, how long it takes. Anyway, for small songbirds, you know, from blackbird down, it takes about 15 to 20 days to grow a single feather like that. We can read that off those bars in some cases. And so the degree to which you overlap them can shorten your replacement period to four weeks. Or if you do it like that flat bill, one at a time for each in each tract, um, it's more like six, six, maybe seven weeks. And uh, it, it just depends on your multi-ecology. Let's see, there we go. Uh, and most of the songbirds we think about molt once a year. That's part of the ecology. They just replace those feathers once a year. But bobolinks are an interesting case. Bobolinks are grassland breeders in the interior, in the Great Plains, in the prairie parts of our, of our continent. And um, when they're breeding, the males are, have this spectacular look of this black plumage, these pale spots, and they do these display flights and sit on top of prairie grasses, um, displaying how, how uh, fancy they look. And in winter, they all look like, look, all look very dull like this. They actually winter in the Llanos in uh, Central, in South America, in Venezuela, Amazon area, in the great uh, open plains there in these huge flocks and blending in um, offers them a little bit of protection there. And so um, they uh, change their look completely from um, 
mate attraction in the summer to camouflage in the winter in the case of the males. The females look more like this in both plumages, um, hiding, being able to hide in the dry grasses. Um, and it turns out that the bobolinks uh, replace their feathers twice a year. Again, that's part of the ecology. Um, I, I think about what, what makes that an effective strategy when it's doubly costly than growing one set of feathers. Well, by being prairie birds, they're exposed to the sun all the time. So the sun is impacting the brittleness of those feathers day in, day out, long summers up in the, in the temperate zone. And then at the equator um, for the rest of the year when they're there. So maybe this is the worst, the best of a bad situation, high feather wear um, areas um, where they need to maintain better feather quality. Um, otherwise they would wear out just like that gull that I showed you on that first slide. So they molt twice a year. That's their strategy to deal with that high wear environment that they are exposed to. Now, those two, those series that we see in the songbirds, that's a pattern that's not very often used in non-songbirds, especially the larger ones. Well, I already showed you a woodpecker. Their patterns are somewhat similar to songbirds, owls too, somewhat similar, um, bee eaters. Uh, so there's, there's um, non-passerines that do similar things. But here's an osprey in Venezuela catching a fish, just caught a fish and carrying it off with one leg. And uh, what's neat about this picture, I, I thought, is this uh, variation in, in, that you see in the wing. You see these very fresh or these pretty fresh inner feathers and then these extremely worn outer feathers. This is a feature of larger birds. It turns out um, when you're, the larger you get as a bird, the more you, you a larger bird requires a disproportionate, more cumulative length of flight feathers. Um, in other words, cumulative length of all these flight feathers to keep it aloft. And so it takes more and more time to replace feathers, your feathers, if you're a flying bird, the larger you get, it makes it harder and harder. The year, if you're molting, if you're, if you've got an annual cycle that's dictated by breeding at a certain time of year, you can't extend your uh, period um, infinitely longer the larger you are. So in, in um, larger birds, we see what's called uh, Staffelmauser, German word, or stepwise molt, and this is the illustration of it. These pale feathers are the juvenile feathers that the bird grew in the nest simultaneously, like we saw with the barn swallows. And this is the effect of the first molt that they go through. Um, they start in the, in the primary one, just like we saw with the songbirds, and they work their way out. So the freshest primary, the one with the most melanin, the least bleach, is this outermost primary that it managed to molt. But it ran out, this bird, right, this osprey, ran out of time there. He's stuck with younger feathers from a previous molt and can't um, complete it at all. Same with the secondaries. He only did a couple secondaries, but in different um, parts of the wing. So basically he's breaking up those secondaries into different series. Series one right here, S1 to S4, and S5 to S10, um, and S13, um, out S11, 12, and 13 out here. So he's uh, replacing these feathers a few of them at a time as well. But apparently that's all he can manage. Um, so he's going through life with a mixed set of feathers through that first year after, after the feather, flight feather replacement. Well, come the next period of molt, this is what, the, what these birds with Staffelmaus will do. They start right out at the place that they ended. So they ended with P6 over here. Next year they start with P7 and start the base, basal feathers, the beginning of the series over again as well. And so that allows him to kind of go through um, as if it were two different series uh, or an interrupted molt and continue from where he um, stopped. Um, but he's still constrained by the number of feathers he can, it can replace in that period of um, molt that's available. And so look at this time, um, they, this bird only gets out to, 
P4. And this other continuation, P7, 8, and 9, well, he couldn't quite manage to get the outermost ones replaced. Same thing here. Um, this bird is starting to molt at the ones that uh, he managed to complete the year before and then molt out from there um, and start over here again, but it did fail to replace this feather and this feather, so they start being old. Um, here it says three sets. That's because you've got a retained juvenile feather, the um, replaced feathers from last year, and the fresh feathers that were replaced this year. But he's never quite getting through, or it's never quite getting through all the feathers because, it, because the bird just doesn't have time during the molt season to get through as much as possible. So the lab I worked in raised the question whether this really is an optimal strategy and wouldn't there be a better strategy? And if you think about it, you can come up with it, what that would be. And so they shopped around and looked for uh, different strategies of birds, but a lot of the, like my advisor did a lot of work on herons. It sh they show a similar Staffelmauser pattern, um, ospreys, hawks. Uh, it's a common pattern for a lot of large birds, pelicans, cormorants, storks, cranes. So it's, um, it's widespread. But eventually, whoops, eventually, uh, one of his students from Singapore was working on um, tree swifts. Now, tree swifts are interesting. They're a family that doesn't occur um, in our neck of the woods. This is the distribution of tree swifts in the world. So from the Indian subcontinent down through um, Oceania uh, on the large, large islands of Indonesia and the Philippines. And they're characterized by swift-like features. What are swift-like features? They're kind of like swallow features, right? They're obligate aerial insectivores. They have to catch their insects on the wing. And uh, interestingly for tree swifts, they're quite a bit larger than um, other swift, than the swifts and the swallows. They're really uh, kind of dominant um, aerial foragers among the birds. And remember what I said about the larger you get, the more wing length you need. So here's the bird that while it isn't huge like an osprey or a pelican, it is big for its ecology. And what this group has evolved is the ability to start their series in one place, molt out to as far as they can get in the period dedicated to molt in their annual cycle. And the next time they start out, they simply start up with the one with a the feather they left off at and uh, proceed out to the end and then wrap around and start again. So they're always molting the most worn feather first without uh, replacing some feathers an extra number of times. And so that maximizes dedicating their molt activity to the feathers that most need it. So wraparound molt um, that was just discovered in the, in the 21st century, like 2001, 2002 is when, when that work was done. So uh, we're learning new things even now about this molt ecology. Okay. There are other strategies too that, we, that we're familiar with. This is not a great picture, but it shows what I'm trying to illustrate here just barely. If you look closely, you'll see um, these two sheaths of flight feathers, uh, and there's more of them in here. It turns out that cuckoos and Watsons, they replace, um, they break up their feathers into several series um, and basically molt alternating feathers. So you see this one and this one, whereas this one, this one between that is going to go next. Um, and similarly, that alternating strategy propagates through the wing. And so just because that bird is flying, you can see how that's working. And that way it protects its ability to fly as well. So there's an alternate strategy to, uh, or a different strategy to maintaining flight while um, proceeding through the wing with uh, this uh, mixed strategy. Okay. I'm in trouble with that. Well, albatrosses, are notable because they're so big that 
they're such big flyers. So albatrosses are our, our biggest seabirds. They're giant three, um, three foot, you know, six foot wingspans, uh, the longest wingspans in the world. Um, and they dominate their, uh, the oceans with the, these enormous wings on which they can soar um, for days on end. And so as you would expect, albatrosses have fairly high ratios of cumulative feather length on their flight feathers to maintain that, to stay aloft like that. So they have this problem that they've got these huge wings um, with uh, something like 13 or 14 um, primaries and interestingly, a variable number of secondaries. It's not even fixed in the species. They just need a lot of flight feather potential on the, in that, in that uh, inner part of the wing. So they have some 25 to 30 uh, secondaries, but it's variable by individual. And so um, what they've done is they've, uh, with that much feather material to replace, they've broken their wings into, um, into multiple sets, kind of like we saw with the stuff in Mausel, but they maintain replacement of them separately. So they've got this outer set, look, this set is worn, and this inner set, this set is looking a lot better, right, these inner primaries. And it turns out those make up two different sets. And the pattern they've developed, the strategy they've developed is not to replace all their feathers or as many feathers as they can in a given year. They alternate between this set and this set in the primaries and similarly, similarly in two sets in the secondaries. So that they're replacing these feathers every two years and these feathers every two years. Now, um, again, they, do, they molt as much as they can and it turns out that they sometimes they just, with the breeding activity and taking care of the offspring for a long time, um, they just end up with not enough time to even maintain replacement of these feathers. What's cool with albatross is that is that in, in you know every four or five years or so, if they've been successful at breeding and had limited success uh, molting, they'll be behind on their molt, and they will simply skip breeding for a season in order to catch up and replace both sets of feathers. So that's their that's their alternating strategy with a caveat that you skip breeding for you, which is a big deal for bird. That means you're really cutting into your reproductive output, uh, but that way you can maintain the quality of your flight feathers to maintain that, that, uh, that wide ranging habit of covering. You, you know that uh, albatross breeding in Hawaii, they come up to, toward Alaska to, you know, to collect food for a week, then fly back to Hawaii on these huge wings to feed their nestlings. The, um, other, other adult, while the, that adult is gone, is resting and uh, taking care, um, then flies off and does the same thing. It's uh, one week bout up to Alaska to feed off squid and other surface material, come back to the nest on Hawaii and regurgitate all that. So these wings are doing amazing things to keep, to manage their, their reproductive strategy, their breeding ecology, as it were. And then um, as one final example, here's, here's a crappy picture. This is a scan from a magazine image. That's why it's so crappy. Um, but this is a, not an extant bird. This is an extinct reconstruction of a bird called um, Argentavis magnificens. And this bird was, was flighted. It's like a giant crow. Here's a human. Um, to compare the size. And um, as a flighted bird, it kind of uh, breaks out of the mold of, well, how, do, how does a bird this large replace all of these feathers, this uh, length of feathers that are just way too long to complete in a given, in a single year? Well, we don't have um, nice fossils of molting birds, but one suggestion by my advisor who uh, examined the potential for this is that a huge bird like this um, just can't manage uh, molting these kinds of feathers um, in a given year. And so, uh, but the benefit of being large like that is that you can carry around quite a bit of weight in stored energy fat or protein. And um, his suggestion is that a bird like this 
would have to um, come to shore or come to land and just drop all these feathers at once and go through a simultaneous molt to just be able to grow them all from the stored material um, on the body, uh, going through a period of fasting to replace feathers. Actually, there's uh, modern birds that do that, and that's um, penguins. They will leap up out of their ocean habitat one day, and they um, have all that stored blubber, uh, and they simply start dropping their little short, tiny feathers, and they drop them all and replace them in a few weeks, just standing there replacing feathers. It's kind of must be an itchy, itchy process to go through that. Okay, um, so now we've looked at the different strategies that birds use to replace their feathers and create these sequences so that they don't lose the capacity for flight, for finding food or escaping predators, um, and can do it in the amount of time available to them in their annual life cycle. To just look at this schematically, I wanted to give you uh, a sense of how um, that looks through the course of a year. So here we've got year one in the life of, of a bird after December, um, then we'll go on to year two and year three. And this is just a schematic of what that looks like. Here's what's in the black bar is what's going on with the bird. So it goes from an egg to a nestling, to a fledgling, to a juvenile. Those are the age classes you can, that we can relate to. Then, um, then a sub-adult immature over the first winter, uh, then um, eventually to a breeding, um, plumage, breeding uh, plumage, if that's, if it's breeding that year, and then finally adult plumage. So this is a schematic for what that might look like in a songbird. Um, <clears throat> so we start with a set of feathers that they grow straight out of the egg. Um, they're already developing inside the egg, natal down is what it's called. And we're familiar with that from baby ducklings, right? The natal down, those feathers just have, they don't really have a central shaft. They are just downy. In fact, this is not a good representation of that, but they're kind of like that after shaft I showed you. They're just the, the kind of a fuzzy down without a, with a minimal central shaft to show for it. So that's kind of what a downy feather would look like. And those juvenile, those natal down nestling um, chicks wander right out of the nest when they're uh, ducklings or they stay in the nest and already go through their first molt uh, in the songbirds. So the, that molt is because it's a feature of feathers of follicles being stimulated to grow and pushing the old feather out, we name the molt with this, uh, after the subsequent plumage. So um, this is an old system. This is the Humphrey Park system that wasn't used for a long time. And now we're more using this Howell system that is more keyed to these uh, naming of these plumages. So this is different ways we've, you'll see the literature referred to these different plumages and the molts, just because um, that can be confusing if you're not sure what, what system is being used. But basically that um, first plumage that you end up with is the juvenile plumage or basic one plumage. And it's characterized by special feathers. Those feathers are downier, fluffier than the adult feathers that the same follicles will grow later. But so that's a distinctive set of feathers. In some birds, even it's fairly easily distinguished from the older birds' feathers. Um, but they have the contour features, the central shaft and the barbs. They're just often fuzzier. And we'll look at that in a little more detail when we do the age uh, characteristics. Then they go through a molt in the first fall. So in September, October, where they replace these, these songbirds, where they replace a lot of that juvenile plumage. Well, a very bold amount of it. For a lot of birds, that's just the body plumage, the fuzzy parts the flight feathers, because they need to be able to fly with them. They grow them fine to begin with, and they keep them through this molt, saving, you know, 30% of the, of the amount of feathers on their body from having to be replaced here. And they just keep those feathers through to the sub-adult sub immature plumage 
formative plumage is what we prefer to call it now, a pl plumage that's becoming uh, in formation, as it were, um, that they carry for the first winter. And from what I've just said, you can realize that it's actually a mix of some juvenile feathers, those flight feathers that it grew in the nest, and the contour feathers that it replaced in that first fall. So formative plumage is often a mixed plumage of, of wearing out juvenile flight feathers and fresher uh, body feathers, maybe already with some um, characteristics of males and females, if that's what the species does. They carry that through the winter. And then around the time of the uh, early spring, um, maybe there's a migration to fit into here. Um, they'll molt again. Uh, in some cases to grow their first breeding plumage and then breed in that plumage. And then finally we get to the kind of the definitive molt, the pre-basic two, the pre-basic molt that yields the basic plumage for the winter. They might migrate south to the tropics for the winter. If they're insect eaters, for example, seed eaters, well, they don't need to, right? They, there's seeds available all winter long. So for, they can start with some fruit, maybe some seeds later. Um, and so they can stick around. It turns out uh, then we get back to this pattern in the third year. That's very similar to what we saw in the second year, except for the feathers being lost might be different. Here it was that mixed plumage. Here it's that adult plumage. Um, and it turns out birds that um, don't migrate well, they can set up territories and start breeding as soon as the weather gets warm. And um, what, we, what we find is that that strategy is much more common in resident and short distance migrants. They don't spend any energy in the spring molting. They'll maintain that plumage through the spring that they had in the winter and head right toward breeding. And then, for example, robins or house finches. Um, or um, what else do we have here in the winter? Chickadees, nuthatches, creepers, brown creepers. All of those birds don't go, go through a spring molt. They don't really change their uh, feathers at all in the spring. And they just maintain a single plumage through the year, um, uh, appropriating any energy they can um, develop from spring sources into maintaining a larger territory or advertising their territory to make potential mates or potential um, competitors or building up for a nest or egg laying. Um, so both males and females have other activities they can attend to with any, any, any energy they get in the spring. So um, residents and short distance migrants, they tend to skip the spring mold. Long distance migrants that come from Central or South America, they might um, use energy in the spring to on the winter grounds to replace some feathers. Because remember, uh, when spring is coming there, when the season is changing, maybe it's not spring in our sense of it, but maybe the, there's a change in the, in the humidity, in the water, in, in the rain features, any extra energy that they can make use of then, um, they can't, it's not like they can migrate earlier because up in Alaska or wherever they're going, um, it's still deep frozen winter. So they may as well spend that energy molting. But in the fall, the pattern is, is the typical pattern we see is that's when you do your complete molt. And then uh, you've got your fresh plumage in the fall. You can migrate or spend the winter on that fresh plumage and then you're ready for breeding in the next season. So there's some naming conventions first year, second year, third year, after hatch year for any bird that's older than, than the first year. Uh, this is all important for people who are trying to keep track of how old birds are uh, and which birds can be distinguished from each other. So this is part of that aging practice that I was telling you about um, for figuring out population scale processes, um, replacement and reproductive reproductive rates, that kind of thing, survivorship. Uh, that's a major feature of bird banding. So that's another class I teach. We, won't, we, we don't really need to spend time with hatch year, second year, after hatch year, and making sure we understand all that. Because mainly what we'll be doing in the field is we'll, we're looking at birds in that juvenile plumage or in that mixed plumage um, and distinguishing them from 
adult birds in some kind of adult plumage. Uh, so we're looking for those fuzzy feathers of the juveniles. All right. So here's, here's an example of, of what's happening. This is what's happening in the nest. Here is the natal down. You see that very fuzzy bit. And here's the juvenile plumage coming in. So this is the pre-juvenile molt, the basic one plumage, the first set of feathers that the bird gets. And you can see it includes all those flight feathers um, and all the body feathers all at the same time. And this is all grown on food brought by the adults because in the nest, those nestlings aren't, getting, aren't feeding themselves. They're growing it off the food brought by the adults. By the way, that's the ear that ends up being covered up with these ear feathers, but that's uh, the opening for the ear. Looks very, very dinosaurian. You can also see on this uh, note that the body feathers on a songbird don't grow everywhere on the body. They're very restricted to specific feather tracts. Uh, that's what we mean with the feather tracts. Um, they're large areas of the body that don't really have any feathers at all, um, that are bare and are covered up because of the feathers in the tracts grow uh, at specific angles to fill in the spaces between the feathers. But that's why like the awkward folding wing can fit in well against the body because there's space for it in those feathers in, in, along the body where the back feathers are in a tract that kind of serve to cover up the folded wing and the breast feathers can, can curve up to nestle the folded wing in against the body and maintain body heat. You can see the tracks here on the head too. It's not all over the body. There's a little bare space there, There's a little bare space behind the ears. So these tracks are slowly filling in um, all that space um, uh, to cover up the, the body, make it look like it's completely covered with feathers. As we've already discussed, the adult molt is sequential. Here you can see a ruby crown kinglet. All these feathers are fresh. Um, they're sheathed at the base. They're, you can see that they're kind of pinched there. Here in the wing, you can really see that molt. So you can see adults molting because they'll be replacing worn out, brown bleached um, old feathers with new feathers coming in. So as we're completing the breeding season, you'll be able to see that uh, these birds with mixed flight feathers those are adults replacing their, their feathers at the end of the season. Here you can see if they spread their wing, you can see the gaps. Right now, it's uh, early July uh, when crows are flying and ravens are flying. I'm seeing um, these gaps in the middle of the wing um, <clears throat> where the crows and ravens are already starting to molt. So look for that on the birds you're birding on your uh, exercises. The great thing is, um, remember I was telling you about the juvenile feathers versus the uh, formative feathers. On the body, you can really tell the difference. So this is a Williamson sapsucker, a higher elevation woodpecker in the Cascades. So even in, uh, in uh, between here and Yakima, you can find these birds in the woods. And I'm showing these pictures because this is a good representation of what you might look for in the field between a young bird going into its um, sub-adult plumage. What you're seeing here is these brown fuzzy-ish feathers. Those are juvenile feathers, that first basic. And these are the feathers that are coming in and replacing some of these. So these are the formative feathers for that, uh, that will help produce that mixed plumage with some juvenile feathers, maybe even some feathers of the head retained. Uh, you can see the mostly the juvenile feathers here. The body's already getting some of these white and black striped feathers, but it's really a mix. And you can see how with binoculars, you could make out that um, difference on, an, on a given bird. So have a look for that um, as you proceed with your, banding, with your birding exercises. And next week, we'll see if you can make those kind of determinations um, in the field on the birds you're looking at to age the birds and look for age specific uh, behavior patterns. So uh, another feature that happens in this uh, molt producing the formative plumage is at some place in the, in the feathers there, in the plumage, there's gotta be this, this contrast between the fresh feathers and the retained feathers. So 
a common feature is that the, um, for example, all the greater coverts will be replaced, but the flight feathers aren't molting. You can see that here, they're all the same. And remember the primary coverts, they molt, molt with their primaries, but they aren't molting. It's only the greater coverts. You see a bird like this um, on the fence in the, in the trees that's got this kind of pattern of replacement in the wing without any replacement of the flight feathers, you're probably looking at a young bird. Remember the young bird is gonna have pretty darn fresh flight feathers um, and kind of a ratty look on the body because those, those juvenile feathers, they wear out pretty quick. They're being replaced and you'll see some replacement on the wing. The adults like on that, uh, uh, kinglet will have some very worn out uh, um, feathers that are a year old and maybe replacing some of them. Um, you'll see that you may be able to see that mix of feathers during the active molt. Whereas with the, with the uh, young bird, the bird of the year, the hatch year bird, the juvenile, uh, the, the juvenile bird going into formative plumage, you'll see just a, a mix of feathers in um, with the flight feathers all being fresh, completely fresh. You see how nicely white edged they are. That's a good signal. So here's another bird where you can see that difference. This is uh, our Oregon Junco. And you can see here, these are some fresh feathers coming in, these blackish ones making the dark hood of the head, but the juvenile bird had grown in these browner feathers that are now being replaced follicle by follicle with these fresher feathers. Here's that contrast really clearly. Here's those fluffier juvenile feathers. Um, here's that contrast again, fluffier juvenile feathers, more streaked, and the browner adult feathers a little more contoured uh, and a little more, a little longer and less streaked on the, on the junco. You can see the contrast in the head too. It looks like, like a really ratty situation, but all those flight feathers are pretty fresh. That's because they just grew them in the nest. Now, some birds in, our, in the West here, they go through this molt, this first molt um, fairly quickly. And so you won't see the active molt. You'll only see the result afterwards. And they can be quite difficult to tell from um, an adult in definitive plumage. Notice what the difference is here. It looks a little duller. It's got a little bit of green edging on that black glossy, that's very glossy in an, in an adult bird that's got fresh feathers. But that adult went through its molt pretty fast and it's got all the fresh adult flight feathers too. So don't be fooled by just having fresh adult flight feathers. It may be an adult that uh, went through its molt quite quickly, but uh, you kind of have to pay attention to the individual species and what its molt ecology dictates about how fast or when it uh, goes through that uh, molt process. So this is a Wilson's warbler. Okay, so now let's look at a few examples of how this molt ecology plays out um, in a way that I think is probably meaningful. So among chickadees in that first molt in the fall, when they're replacing their juvenile feathers, what's interesting to me is that um, we have three species of chickadees in North America that occur kind of in latitudinal bands. Um, the boreal chickadees are the farthest north, so they have the shortest summer. The blackcaps are in the middle, that's the one that occurs here. Boreal chickadees, by the way, occur up in the North Cascades in Washington, but are pretty scarce. So it's more, more uh, the mountains of Canada and northern boreal forests of Canada. Black keeps caps in a wide swath across the middle part of the country or the continent and Carolinas are restricted to the southern area uh, of, the, of the continent on the east side. Um, in that first sprint, th this illustration shows what they re the young birds replace in their first fall. Look, the boreals don't replace any flight feathers, primary coverts, kind of expect that. But they also don't replace any greater coverts and not even some of the median coverts. So it's restricted just to these most closest to the body feathers, not even all the median coverts here. Black caps replace about half of their greater coverts. That's what happens here in Washington too. And all these upper uh, feathers of the wing um, covering up the, the mm, patagium of the wing. And the Carolina chickadee, it molts 
all the greater coverts, all the median coverts, all the potassium, and even into some of these alula feathers, um, and look, all the tertials as well. So there's a real gradation um, related to how long the summer is in, as to what these birds are, are replacing. I don't think that's an accident. I think that uh, these are adaptations for their particular uh, locations um, relating to the, what I'm talk, calling the ecology of molt. Similarly, here is, uh, is a similar kind of ecological representation of, of uh, um, Melospiza sparrows, song, swamp, and it's a genus of sparrows that includes song, sparrow, swamp sparrow, and Lincoln sparrow. Um, song sparrow is one we're familiar with. Swamp sparrow occurs uh, in the north and the east in, in marshy areas, and Lincoln's occurs in mountain meadows and, um, and northern boggy swamps as well. And what we see is a uh, spring molt in Melospiza sparrows. Um, if you think about their, the habitats they occupy, song sparrows occupy the driest of the habitats. Swamp sparrows are in swamps, pretty wet areas, and Lincoln sparrows are in areas where morning dew and just bogginess is extreme. And they show this gradation in spring molts where song sparrows don't replace hardly any body feathers in the spring. Ah, but if you remember, you might remember that I pointed out that Washington song sparrows do, re do a little bit of replacement in spring. But in any case, um, the received wisdom is that they don't do any spring molt. Um, swamp sparrows, however, replace feathers of the head and Lincoln sparrow in the spring replace uh, most of their body feathers in the spring. One problem that birds encounter is feather eating bacteria. Feather eating bacteria thrive in wet environments. And so I've wondered whether this um, gradation in increasing habitat moisture relates to this, this adaptation of spring molt in the birds to discourage, to slough off um, the populations of, of feather eating bacteria that might accumulate on a bird if it were to keep its feathers body feathers through the whole year. And so that this particular feature of molt might be a particular adaptation to the kind of moisture gradients they ex are exposed to. No one's done that kind of testing, but that would be definitely a, a cool kind of test um, process that one could expose these um, skins to, these, uh, to see if, uh, if um, what, those, what the levels of the bacteria are or to see if, what the damage is or to see um, just experimentally what the uh, degradation would be um, for exposed feathers in those different environments over a course of a season. So that's the kind of uh, questioning I'm interested in with, um, with the ecology of molt. One pr project I did was looking at um, patterns of black-headed grosbeak molt. And this kind of work is uh, often takes place in museums where specimens collected over hundreds of years um, properly stored and maintained um, can help resolve questions that weren't even thought of when these birds were um, collected. And so examining, examining each of these specimens for the molt pattern, you can see the, the different age groups, males, males, juveniles, females, um, a mix here um, sorted by different uh, uh, months or location can help reveal what the pattern is. What I found in working on, on gross peaks is that it's remarkably hard to find specimens across all the museums from the period in which the molt takes place. It turns out um, uh, this is the total distribution of gross peaks with the fewest collected in September, October, November, and December. And it turns out that the proportion of those that are adults that replace all their flight feathers is lowest in September. In fact, so low that I hardly got a sample with which to show that these gross beaks are migrating first in August and then molting on the wintering grounds um, in Mexico. Um, but it was hard to do because people just, I, I think they bias against uh, molting birds because they just look so crappy. In any case, it can be somewhat frustrating to do this kind of work when you realize um, 
just the collecting bias against the particular group of bird you're, birds you're, you're actually trying to work something out for. So there's the number of specimens I evaluated for each of these months for each of these characters. All right, so that's a little bit on molt ecology after going through the molt uh, sequence and the molt strategies that we see in birds. Kind of a summary of that. Okay, let's stop here.